<laughs> All right, here we go. Everybody see the screen? Right on. <laughs> Greetings, cherished members of the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy's Mighty Imaging Special Interest Group. And special welcome to all our wonderful colleagues from the AOPT and from all over the APTA. I'm Bruno Steiner, and I'm the current president of the Imaging SIG for the APTA's Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. We are so very fortunate and, and frankly privileged that former Imaging SIG president, Dr. Chuck Hazel, and former AOPT president, Dr. Bill Boysenault, who are going to give us a substantial first look at their recently completed research. Uh, so looking forward to this excellent fresh data just for the holidays and before we get ourselves ready for 2024. And can you believe how quickly this year has gone by? Um, tonight, we're promised some exciting results as our dear colleagues present DPT Imaging Education. Will graduates be prepared for today and tomorrow's practice? As revered academicians, Chuck and Bill are tireless advocates for physical therapist imaging privileges in the actualization of primary care PT. And unlike any other uh, allied healthcare professional, the doctor of physical therapy education is uniquely mandated by CAPTI to provide an educational focus on radiological imaging along with a curriculum rich and specialized in orthopedic principles. The evidence is abundantly clear that PTs are currently ordering imaging studies appropriately and judiciously. But that doesn't stop Drs. Boysenault and Hazel's relentless drive for excellence in academic practices to prepare our future standard bearers to fulfill their goals of autonomous and primary care PT practice. I can't wait to hear from Chuck and Bill, but first, I do have to get through a few business items for our imaging SIG members and review our nation's imaging sport, uh, scorecard before we, get, we begin. And um, if, wow. if you heard it before, uh, uh -huh. please mute yourselves. Um, if you've heard it before, uh, all of it before, uh, well, as any registered musculoskeletal ultrasonologist with an RMSK would say, repetition is the mother of mastery. And uh, you see how I work diagnostic ultrasound there already, Chuck? And I, I, I know I'm incorrigible. I'm a zealous, true believer. Uh, here we go. I want to remind you of last month's amazing membership meeting with Dr. Scott Rizak, who describes his implementation of physical therapist directed imaging referral in Colorado, where the Practice Act was silent for years. I implore you to check this out. I think PTs have the general impression that they need to gird themselves um, for a hard legislative battle, when in most, case is, in most cases, it really isn't necessary. So please contact, contact us at the Imaging SIG to check your options and take advantage of all the incredible resources we have for you. Our web uh, membership meeting with Scott Rizak is going, a few, it's going through a few edits now, and it should be out pretty soon. So please sign up for the AOPT's Imaging SIG or email me to get the link. In January, I'm really stoked about uh, locking in Dr. Scott Brown who is also going to present some remarkable and encouraging data that speaks to the efficacy of PT-directed imaging in North Dakota. And I'll say it again, we're going to return to our annual in-person imaging SIG meeting at the, the APTA Combined Sections Meeting 2024 in Boston. Uh, yep, CSM 24 is just around the corner and the roadshow is going to rumble into the cradle of liberty. Mark it in your calendars. The imaging SIG meeting will happen on Saturday, February 15th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. I'm excited to chat with all of you in person. I look forward to seeing you all there. I'll be on my ever groaning, creaking soapbox, which is already suffering under the weight of my incessant grousing and advocating for imaging privileges for the primary care physical therapist. Uh, I'm gonna reveal our strategy moving forward to winning more states and ultimately tackle and to topple the CMS language that has proven to be an albatross around our necks for too long. And yes, 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 I'm going to talk about diagnostic ultrasound in the hands of the physical therapist as well, which is absolutely near and dear to my heart. And if you are not impressed by this gorgeous rectus femoris tear in the longitudinal axis, then I don't know what to say. All hope is lost. If you don't think this is going to impact the way you treat patients, well, God, anyway. And speaking of which, I just want to quickly remind everyone of the unique opportunity offered by the gold standard credentialing body Intelios and their registries who recognize physical therapist eligibility to their certifications. I've got some people who need to police their mute buttons. All right. We should all be taking advantage of this, uh, of the privilege of sitting uh, for the RMSK physician credential for muscus imaging governed by Intelios's Alliance for Physic Physician Certification Advancement. 
this is an unbelievable opportunity to test our metal against other physicians who also vie for this certification. Uh, we're doing it and we're keep, we keep on passing it in very, very impressive numbers. Uh, we are good at this exam and we got this. What do you need? Okay, Adam, you got to police your phone. All right. And, and you should take advantage of the Intellios' POCUS Academy selection. So this is Point of Care Ultrasound Certification Academy. Unbelievable selection of uh, certifications for us. We are eligible to sit this. Um, they have recognized our, uh, our eligibility uh, for some time now. Uh, this has got some amazing certifications in musculoskeletal ultrasonography, as well as vascular uh, applications, abdominal trauma, cardiac, you name it. So we can take all this and you should take advantage of it. Um, and I just want to remind people that the AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, actually recognizes physical therapists as licensed medical providers of muscus. You heard that correctly. So on March 13th, we're following through with our colleague, the irrepressible Dr. Lance Mabry, assistant professor from High Point University, North Carolina. He'll be reporting some fresh data from his most recently published observational study, physical therapist awareness of diagnostic imaging referral, jurisdictional scope of practice. He's also recently published, physical therapists are routinely performing the requisite skills to directly refer for musculoskeletal imaging, an observational study. And if you haven't read it yet, uh, I really strongly encourage you to. Uh, this is a seminal work. It's a great read and it's absolutely germane to what we're trying to achieve for our country's public health policy, our patients' well-being, as well as for our beloved profession. So where are we with imaging referral privileges? I'm going to super abridge my usual nationwide count to take all your questions offline if you wish and if you want to discuss strategic planning for your individual states. Um, and that's how you really should look at us uh, here at the ISIG as your rapid response resource. Don't plan it alone and reinvent a faultier wheel. I implore you to contact us as you trailblaze forward with your respective uh, states. So this is it. Uh, this is the lay of the land. Deep green, you have states where we can order everything. That includes MRI. Um, in the green, the light green states, we are only allowed to order x-rays. And I got to admit, these are victories, but I'm still vexed by the decision makers that uh, that didn't allow us full access. They seem to be okay with allowing us uh, uh, <laughs> imaging that requires ionizing radiation, uh, but somehow can't make that bridge uh, far enough to make it to MRI, which is completely benign in contrast. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing how we progress in those states. But, you know, we got radiography there. In the gray states, we actually have something very interesting. There's no prohibition uh, to imaging referral. In actuality, it's the practice acts are silent. Uh, and very much like we saw with Colorado, it doesn't prohibit you from ordering imaging. What you're going to wind up uh, probably discussing with the, your local radiologist uh, to take your referrals if there's any doubt, um, but largely people haven't had problems there, uh, those who have ventured uh, forward and use this, um, use this method of moving forward. So the light gray actually has language in the Prax Act that says Röntgen, which is x-rays. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll give you three guesses of how that language got installed onto our practice acts. Basically means you're not allowed having a radiography, you don't, you're not allowed performing x-ray uh, plain film studies in your clinic and turning on the switch. So like I said, three guesses who managed to parlay that into our practice act. Most alarmingly, uh, the states in red have explicit language against PT directed imaging, and these are real setbacks. These states are going to need tough legislative battles to make any gains moving forward. And I gotta tell you, um, I'm really concerned about the decision makers who got, a, got us to this point and who might be frankly out of step with current realities of the physical therapy profession and education and plainly speaking, I'm really concerned that they might be inadvertently, purposely hamstringing our ability to serve the public's interest in the face of physician and nursing shortages. So I think we have a real opportunity to marshal the vastly under leveraged skill sets of the primary care physical therapist. And I worry that some decision makers might be unwitt unwittingly blowing it for their licensees as well as for the public. And I think the time has come for our deliberative bodies to reflect our professional realities. And we've got to pay more attention to this.
So the military branches have no such prohibitions to imaging referral and have proven their efficacy of PT-directed imaging referral since the 70s. And this really constitutes an important precedent and needs to be vigorously cited on every occasion. And this is what we ultimately want to reflect in the Center of Medicare Services and all state laws, opinions, and rulings. So the three uh, paths to PT-directed imaging referral. One, you can just exercise the lack of prohibition from the Practice Act. Just don't refer a CMS patient because the radiologist will not be paid for imaging in the case of Medicare patients if the PT makes the order. And that's something I want to address in the, my, my, my tenure. Um, so this is the easiest way forward, frankly. The second one is to get a favorable state board ruling using proper calibrated questions, which require your board member to focus on the Practice Act language. You really got to watch out with this. It's not as easy as it seems. Uh, you really can't just ask, gosh, guys, is it in our practice act to refer imaging? You, you, we can't keep shooting ourselves in the foot by asking that type of question. You have to be thoughtful, prepare it, provide context, and really direct the, uh, their attention to the language of your state practice act. Please contact us. We've got those type of questions. We can help you with the model question that you might want to prepare for this type of approach. The third one, the legislative initiative, is the hardest approach, and that requires max preparation. I like reminding people, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your lowest preparation. This takes coordination. Please, again, contact us if you're gonna pursue that, that route. I know you can do it. Corey, Corey Zimney from Iowa and Team Iowa did that just recently, got us all kinds of privilege in imaging, and that was really exciting. That was a legislative initiative, but boy, did they do some work to do it. So, and now for the main event, on a personal note, Chuck and Bill are vital, important colleagues, advocates, and collaborators, and are always there for me despite their all too crazy schedules, and I'm glad to introduce them to you. Leading off, University of Wisconsin-Madison's Professor Emeritus, Dr. Bill Boisenault, currently holds multiple adjunct physical therapy faculty positions. You might know him from his previous positions, including Executive VP of Professional Affairs, APTA, and as former president of this very Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, as well as the Foundation of Physical Therapy Research. He's presented nationally and internationally on topics related to medical screening, diagnostic imaging, and direct access. Uh, he's also responsible for countless publications, and among his numerous awards, um, he's received the Lucy Blair Service Award, which is the Education Section's Distinguished Educator Award, and the Uni uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison Medical School Dean's Teaching Award for Excellence in and Innovation in Medical Education. And following Bill, we are delighted to have Ch Dr. Charles Hazel. Chuck is an associate professor at the University of Kentucky, where he's taught musculoskeletal content for the past 27 years. So he's probably, he probably knows a lot of stuff. Uh, he's co-authored two textbooks on diagnostic imaging and contributed to numerous transcripts and book chapters on imaging in physical therapist practice and various components of manual examination and treatment procedures. He's similarly presented at conferences at all levels about imaging. He served two terms as my predecessor, the president of the AOPT's Imaging SIG, and he's taught imaging content at multiple physical therapy educational programs domestically and abroad. Uh, he was a primary author of the initial imaging educational manual and an ongoing contributor to the manual under, rev under revision and a principal author of the legendary imaging white paper. Uh, once again, I want you to police your, your mute buttons and I want you to take it away, Bill and Chuck. We are so grateful to have you here and uh, looking forward to hearing this exciting, exciting stuff. Very good. Thank you, Bruno. I'll work on sharing my screen here. Bruno, you want to give me a thumbs up if you see the slide on the screen? All right, very good, very good. Uh, well, welcome everybody. And I want to start on behalf of Chuck and I thanking the Imaging SIG for the, the invite for this, uh, this, this neat opportunity. And certainly to thank all of you for carving time out of your busy lives. It's holiday season, end of the semester for many of you. Um, so very glad that uh, you're joining us this evening. Um, the title, the question that's embedded in the title here, this was the impetus for Chuck and I doing the, the survey. Um, and to answer this question, the short answer is um, we're making progress, uh, but we have some work to do. Uh, that's the short answer. 
the long answer is coming up as uh, Chuck and I go through the, the presentation here. Um, our, our primary objective is, is to provide you with an update on the current status of the imaging curricula in, uh, in our DPT programs and then tied to the data that many of you provided, thank you very much to those of you who uh, completed the survey. Uh, based on those data, we'll provide an overview of the challenges and opportunities related to incorporating imaging into curriculum integration and as well as student assessment. Kind of our agenda for this presentation is I'm gonna start with the why. Uh, why did we feel it was time to do uh, an update? Uh, regarding imaging curricula in our DPT programs. Chuck will follow with what we did and how we did it, the methodology, and then we'll both share the results and kind of the so what's associated with each of those results. And then again, our goal is to have time for Q&A. And maybe if you want to use the chat box, um, you know, as Bruno mentioned, there'll be time for Q&A at the very end. But if you want to put comments and questions in the chat box, that'll help speed up our uh, the discussion component of this. So before we get into details of the why, just like, this is almost like a disclaimer. Um, and I don't think there's any surprises here. And I, I just can't believe any of you would disagree with any of this. But just to make it clear where Chuck and I are coming from, we are all about advocating for appropriate utilization, appropriate ordering of imaging modalities. And then tied to that is advocating for the appropriate training of our graduates and not just preparing them for today's practice, but also for tomorrow's practice. We're also operating under the assumption that a majority of patients with common with low back pain, neck pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, majority of those patients do not need imaging, especially at the beginning of the episode of care. Um, but some patients do, and it's, criti it's critical that we recognize those patients. And I think as more and more PTs start practicing in emergency departments and urgent care settings, you know, that percentage of patients where it is needed up front in the episode of care is probably going to grow some. But the assumption is that the majority of patients that we're seeing with these common conditions, imaging is not indicated early in the episode of care. And of course, all three of those are tied in with, we don't want to become part of the overutilization problem. And it's not just a yes or no, do we uh, refer patients or not, but the inappropriate timing of imaging also can be very, very problematic. There are many, many papers out there that show that imaging early on in these episodes of care can lead to poor outcomes on all kinds of levels. So again, we don't want to become part of that problem, and that relates to the training that our students are getting as they go through our programs. So the why. Um, with, uh, with some colleagues back in 2014, uh, Doug White, Wayne Smith, and Britt Malin and Sarah Carney. Uh, Britt and Sarah were students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the time. That's where we did the original benchmark survey of, of DPT programs and imaging curricula. And so here we are nine years later, post-publication, doing it again, basically doing the survey. So it's not just a matter of the fact that nine years has gone by. That, does, that alone is, does not make it relevant in terms of a need for an update. But what happened between 2014 and now that, that kind of pushed Chuck to, to do the project? Well, things on multiple levels. We look at the APTA level and House of Delegates. You know, the position on diagnosis, that was, that was adopted in 2012. So that was pre the 2014 paper, but that was part of the impetus for doing the benchmark survey back then. But that position clearly states that when indicated, physical therapists order appropriate uh, tests, including but not limited to imaging, and may also perform or interpret selected imaging. And then a follow-up to that in 2016, the House of Delegates adopted kind of a resolution that ABTA pursue practice authority. Uh, so going beyond the, the practice statement of position and diagnosis, but it's we need to ramp up our efforts to pursue practice authority related to imaging referral. CAPTI. Kathy added some language in 2015 uh, in terms of describing ev the evaluative criteria standard seven, that the curriculum includes content learning experiences in the following areas, including diagnostic imaging. And related to each of those content areas, again, as part of, excuse me, as part of standard seven, 
The curriculum includes the content itself, a variety of learning experience, student assessment, and evaluation processes required for not just practice today, but for lifelong learning as well. So that's new language since the 2014 paper. The Federation State Board of Physical Therapy, the Model Practice Act, which is the kind of the standard, uh, preeminent standard, and from their perspective, most effective tool available to revise and modernize physical therapy practice acts. So in the seventh edition, they added language to the practice of physical therapy means, so part D, referring a patient to healthcare providers and facilities for services and testing. And then further down uh, in this document, testing means uh, standard methods and techniques used to gather data, including not limit to diagnostic imaging. So again, this is this seventh edition just came out within the last 12 to, to 14 months. In some of the, the states that have practice act language specifically stating that physical therapists order imaging, there are three that include practitioner qualifications in their language. So Wisconsin, North Dakota, and West Virginia. And interestingly, all three, one of the qualifications includes a physical therapist holding a clinical doctorate degree, a DPT, uh, graduates of a CAPTI accredited DPT program. So from their perspective, if you have that, then it doesn't say you need five more years of, of clinical experience. It doesn't mean you have to have gone through uh, an, an accredited <laughs> clinical residency program or be a, a certified clinical specialist. The assumption is that someone coming out with a DPT degree in these states have the ability, the knowledge base and the skills to make the appropriate decision of when and when not to order these imaging modalities. So Wisconsin was the first one to include qualification, and that was in 2017. So kind of review, this is another way to present what Bruno uh, presented, but coming back to pre-2014 to post-2014. So pre-2014, there were three states at the time uh, that had in the rules and regulations, the statutory language that PTs could, could order imaging. Since then, and really since 2017, we have eight more states. And again, as Bruno described, some it's plain films only, and other states it's plain films plus other imaging modalities. So there's been a significant increase in number of states where it explicitly states somewhere in the Practice Act or in the rules and regulations that PTs have the, uh, the ordering abil uh, ab ability and privileges. Also since 2014, and really part of what came out of the benchmark study that we, that we published in 2014, a couple of resources were developed. So the Imaging Education Manual uh, and the list of content is listed there for you. So kind of historical right. perspective, uh, the association positions and practice standards, the legislative regulatory status, um, and then you've got the link. And we'll, we'll make this PowerPoint file available to you after the, the session this evening. So this was, uh, again, a, a resource for faculty who were teaching this content area. And as already as already mentioned, it came out about the same time was the white paper. Um, again, historical overview, physical therapist education and training, practice regulation, payment, and then the future. And part of the impetus for both of these resources, the white paper and the education manual, was that the 2014 survey revealed there was a huge range of variability from one program to another in terms of what was being taught, were students being assessed, or to assess to what degree. So hoping to promote you know, less uh, variability between programs was a big impetus for these two documents uh, to, be, uh, to be created. So again, since 2014, a lot has changed in the practice world, in the legislative world, the world of rules and regulations. Some resources were developed. So were those resources successful in reducing the degree of variability? That really was the impetus for the, the, the repeat of the, of the survey. So now I'll turn it over to Chuck for the, the what we did and how we did it. All right, thanks, Bill. So we took the initial survey instrument that Bill and his colleagues initially formulated, and we updated a bit, bearing in mind that initial survey was a hard copy 
<laughs> sent out with a return self-addressed envelope. So we updated things a bit and we constructed this on REDCap based on that prior instrument. We sent it out to five prominent imaging educators for their review. And uh, they took a look at that and sent comments back to us. This went through the Institutional Review Board at the University of Kentucky. And we launched the survey on December 15, 2022. We sent this to all CAPTI listed programs, uh, both accredited and developing initially because we derived this purely from the entire CAPTI listing. All right, next slide, Bill. So our initial email contact was actually to the program chairs listed on CAPTI. And our specific request was that the survey be completed by the chair or the faculty member who was in charge of coordinating imaging instruction. There were three total group email contacts where we sent this out to everyone. Um, in follow-up to that, we knew that many people were tired of receiving surveys and perhaps there was uh, some hesitation to complete those. So Bill and I, individually contacted many people across the country. So instructors that we knew who, who teach imaging or we went to several websites of programs and identified as best we could those persons who might teach imaging and we contacted them individually to please complete the survey. Based on our individual contacts and the, the data as we saw it, it appeared that our individual contacts actually yielded about 75% of the total responses that we had. <clears throat> Next. So our data collection closed on April 1. Ultimately, we decided to focus on the 272 accredited programs at that time. So we had 164 responses, so slightly better than a 60% response rate, which we think was um, actually quite good. And we were are reporting group data only. Only the individual institu individual institutions are not identified. With the arrangement that we had in REDCap, we could see if an institution responded or not, but we could not see the individual data of those institutions. So that allowed us to do the multiple follow-ups and trying to seek um, as robust a response as possible. Next. So our data, we ultimately decided to only use the accredited program. So there, at that time, there were 272 accredited programs, a total of over 320. So there were over 50 developing programs at that time that we launched the survey. Their response rate was very poor. And if we looked at their data, many of them actually were uh, quite a bit away from graduating a class. So we felt like their curricula were actually not well developed enough that we could, that we would actually want to include them in our data analysis. So we ultimately decided to just use the 272 accredited programs. We our data is analysis is actually very simple, basic descriptive statistics. Some respondents did not answer all of the questions, and we're reporting on percentages and proportions only for those individual questions. Next. Okay, I'll take the baton from Chuck and start the results section. So one of the things we wanted to look at was how and when imaging content was being integrated in, included and integrated into the curriculum. So we broke it down to year one, you know, first semester, second semester, or quarter one, quarter two. And um, actually, these numbers are fairly consistent with what we saw back in 2014. So uh, many of the programs are introducing it in year one, and in about 44% of all the respondents, um, they included it in the very first semester or the first quarter. Um, and it makes sense that, you know, for any content area, the earlier it's introduced, more opportunities there are to come back and revisit that content area and apply it in, in multiple ways and in, in multiple, multiple contexts throughout the semester. Um, what was noted for many of the programs, uh, including the, introducing this in the first year, the content area was actually introduced in human anatomy, 
Um, there are students who were being assessed in their anatomy of practical exams to identify structures on plain films or potentially on MRI. Um, there were other programs that introduced it in their introduction to or foundations of physical therapy, the profession, the introduction to the profession, um, and a very small percentage waited until year three to, uh, to introduce this content area. Uh, the bottom of the slide, how was it integrated? And was there a required course, an elective? Um, programs, responders, responders could check multiple items here, which accounts for, we have way more than 160 responses, uh, but almost half had a required imaging course. Um, a very small number, it, it, was, it was, content was found in a separate elective course. And so the content was in a required imaging course or is integrated into multiple other courses. The clinical science track, you know, the MSK, the neuro, the cardiovascular pulmonary track, um, that, that's about a third of the respondents said imaging was integrated into those courses. And then the item above that, component of multiple courses, those courses were in clinical, a clinical medicine course, the pathology course, differential diagnosis course. Um, so again, I think the, the assumption is that imaging content uh, is being introdu introduced early on as a general rule and then shows up in multiple courses as students course the way through the curriculum. In terms of the instructional hours and the methods of, of instruction, it's so not a big surprise. Uh, about half of the hours it occurred in the classroom in the lecture. Uh, mode of delivery. Um, there was a, a number of programs and a number of hours that were presented in online coursework, and there are a lot of online options out there for faculty to, to incorporate into uh, the various courses. A laboratory setting, so whether that was human anatomy or um, in the MSK lab courses, that imaging was being integrated into the material that was being covered. And, uh, and certainly more so than back in 2014, I'm mean, still a small percentage, but about 13% about um, it was being presented and, uh, and, and, and brought to the students around the con realm of patient care, whether it's a simulated patient experience or uh, an actual patient themselves. In terms of the emphasis by you know, uh, the primary body systems that, that we work with. Uh, so I have the 2014 numbers up on top and, and 2023 down below. And just not a big change, but a little bit of change. So musculoskeletal, that is over 80%. That, that's the emphasis in the, uh, in the responders programs. And then we have a much smaller percentage in adult neuro, cardiovascular and pulmonary and pediatric neuro. Um, so I'm not sure there's, it's really surprising that MSK is so heavily represented here, but some of the things that we pulled from our data that would I think would help explain it was that you know, two-thirds of our faculty reported that their primary area of clinical practice was orthopedics slash sports. Um, for those that had a were a clinical specialist, 62% uh, of all of our responders reported, again, it was ortho or sports was their area of specialty, uh, compared to only, you know, six, about six and a half percent of having other certifications, whether that was neuro or geriatrics or pediatrics. Of the 19 total faculty that reported completing an accredited uh, residency program, uh, 18 of the 19, it was in orthopedics and sports. A little over 20% of, of the responding faculty were fellows of AOPT. And then some other reasons, again, the comparative long history of MSK imaging is embedded in the military model, uh, the triaging model that began back in the early 1970s. And in many of the publications that have occurred uh, over the years related to PT practice and imaging, the majority of those settings were in outpatient MSK, outpatient orthopedic settings. And the five imaging modalities that, that we looked at, it was plain film, the radiographs, MR, CT, bone scan, and sonography, and that they maybe have more relevance to clinical practice in the MSK realm compared to the, the, uh, these other venues. Um, in terms of, again, coming back to content areas, so uh, about a third of the hours were spent teaching students regarding the clinical guidelines, 
Um, when is imaging referral? When is it indicated? When is it not? Uh, integration of imaging results in the uh, in with examination, other examination findings to develop the plan of care. And then a little smaller percentages related to strengths and limitations of imaging modalities and the physical property of the imaging modalities. And then the last slide for my section here in terms of assessing student competence. Um, Again, there seem to be more, more tools utilized in the recent survey compared to the 2014 survey. So majority of the students are being tested in written examinations, a little over a third in a practical examination, you know, identifying structures or identifying pathology as, as part of an examination uh, with a simulated patient, real patient exam, and then end of a curriculum exam. So the, the last item, end, of, end of, of curriculum exam, a significant drop compared to 2014. So either it just happened that the majority of the programs that we surveyed in 2023 did not have an end of curriculum exam. Maybe fewer programs are including it in the end of curriculum exam. We're still not quite sure how to explain that, that drop from 2014 to 2023. All hey, right, Josh. We also looked at any limitations or barriers that the faculty may have and in terms of including imaging content. And almost 44% actually said none. Then the most frequently cited barriers were a lack of qualified faculty and not enough time in the curriculum. Also cited were a lack of published criteria to guide instruction, a lack of literature describing imaging and PT practice, Imaging not considered an entry-level skill by a small percentage, along with imaging not considered a curricular priority. I think if we look at those top two, we can look at those to some degree as being uh, issues within the program in, in terms of how they manage their uh, priorities within the, the faculty. And if we look at the bottom four, four, I see those perhaps more as professional perspective issues uh, and how imaging relates to PT practice. All right, next. All right, for the next step, how do we improve student knowledge and competency? By far, or certainly the most robust response was increased emphasis on clinical affiliations along with instructional hours. Specialist guest lecture also was cited by a few and no change required by uh, around 6%. The increased emphasis on clinical affiliations, we will come back around to that a little bit more toward the end. Next. In terms of the resources for students, we broke this down looking at uh, required, recommended, or not used. If we, if we look at the ACR, American College of, of Radiology Appropriateness Criteria, we see that a little more than a third uh, require the ACR appropriateness criteria for their students, a little less than a third recommended. I think the more concerning part here is that approximately a third do not get exposure to the ACR appropriateness criteria. Other resources include the JOSPT imaging feature and JOSPT cases. Again, we see those commonly used in terms of um, being recommended a little bit more than required, but again, around 29% of students not getting exposure to imaging specifically applicable to physical therapist practice. Radiopedia is another valuable resource, and we see, that, see it required in a relatively small percentage and recommended in a large percentage but once again, around 40% not getting exposure to radiopedia. I think it's important to note too with radiopedia that they have a robust set of images and uh, frequently they're, they're, there's a very rich inclusion of case-based scenarios in radiopedia. Textbooks were by far the most commonly used resources and you can see that by the percentage there that apparently some curricula recommended or required more than one text. And among the texts that are out there, the McInnes text was by far the most frequently used. Next, what about resources for faculty? 
Again, if we look at the ACR appropriateness criteria, slightly more than half of faculty do not use the ACR appropriateness criteria, and our proportions are about the same for JOSPT imaging or JOSPT cases. Again, specifically in the context of PT practice. Radiopedia, uh, quite a few faculty use them, but again, less than half. And again, textbooks, again, the McInnes text by far the most frequently used. Next. I think you heard Bruno's pitch on the Academy for Orthopedic Physical Therapy Imaging SIG, a, another great set of resources available through the Imaging SIG. And only slightly more than half of the faculty who responded to the survey were members of the Imaging SIG. And indeed, many were not even aware of the existence of the Imaging SIG. If we broke that down by members and non-members, we saw that the members are, are more frequently using the ACR appropriateness criteria than are non-members. So we wanted to include a, a topic area specifically for ultrasound that showed some transition from 2014 to 2023, because overall, if you look at the totality of our data, certainly ultrasound is much more prominent in the 2023 data. These are percentages of the programs that actually spend time in these instructional areas. We looked at all the, all of the modalities in these five instructional areas, and if this was actually included as part of the curriculum. So the greatest change that we see there is in identifying soft tissue pathological processes and injuries going from 40% to almost 58% in 2023. I'm sure you could tell from Bruno's initial advocacy that he's not gonna be happy till that number is sitting at 100. All right, next slide. If we looked at expectations of outcomes, assessment, and competence, I have two examples here from our data. We look at radiography and we see that 95% of respondents actually believe that use of the clinical guidelines for referral for radiography is actually an entry-level skill. But 82% assess for competence. And then looking at the perception of competence, this was on a scale of zero to five, zero not assessed, one not competent, five competent. This time around in 2023, the perception of comp competence was at 4.2 compared to 3.7 in 2014. The other example that we have here on the next slide is on MRI. We have 84% believe that using clinical guidelines for referral is also an entry-level skill but in this case, only 62% or so assess for competence. I think an important uh, perspective to look on this is the assessment for competence. The testing is actually part of the preparatory process, including preparation for the NPTE and preparation for practice. So I would hope that we would see that number go up in the future. The perception of competence relating to MRI clinical guidelines was at 3.7 out of five. If we look at, on the next slide, if we look at all of those five imaging modalities and we look at the changes from 2014 to 2023, we see that the perception of competence across all the modalities have increased. But as Bill said, I think we still have some work to do for all of those numbers to go yet higher. Next. If we look at some other comparisons of 2014 to 2023, we have to start at the number of programs. When Bill and his colleagues first did this survey, uh, they had 206 programs. In 2023, when we launched this, there were 272 accredited programs or a 32% increase. And again, I will note that at the time we launched this survey, there were over 50 programs in development. So. Um, that's certainly worthy of note in terms of changes from the prior survey and, and the larger landscape of what's happening in PT education. As Bill mentioned, many of the proportions are similar, but we see and we see that all the perceived competency values with the modalities have increased, some quite substantially. 
We see again that there's greater recognition of the use and the value of ultrasound in PT practice. And uh, as again, as noted, we still got we still have some work to do in some of these areas. All right, if we move ahead to challenges and opportunities, of course, many curricula, many faculty feel the pressure of perpetually adding new content, and that certainly is a challenge. And now we see that there are some curricula across the country that are actually shortening the duration of their programs, which adds still yet another dimension to, to complicating this issue. We believe, however, that um, the instructors should make greater use of many of these readily available resources. I think you could see from our data that there are resources out there that are perhaps being underutilized that could make teaching uh, for instructors more efficient and perhaps more effective. And there are many people out there who have conquered this mountain. There are several people out there who have successfully been able to integrate this imaging content into their curricula and do an excellent job with it. And of course, the integration of imaging content across the continuum of the curriculum is certainly what's going to be best for setting up durable learning and for successful entry into practice, especially when incorporated in a clinical context. Now, while, <clears throat> while we're saying a lot about instructors, uh, we certainly need to do a better job with distribution and dissemination of these available resources to encourage their use on a much wider scale. We, As, of course, was mentioned, a greater emphasis during clinical affiliations or internships was actually the number one cited reason uh, or number one cited uh, next step in terms of how to expand student understanding. So there are opportunities here for programs to work with clinical instructors, perhaps partner with clinical instructors in providing continuing education for benefit to the clinical instructors and the students under their mentorship. Next slide. So among the opportunities that we have that we want to look forward to are faculty working cooperatively with state associations. Bruno mentioned that um, there are multiple ways that can be undertaken to achieve imaging referral privileges. And we think that's, that uh, the instructors in those jurisdictions, the programs in those jurisdictions should certainly be aware of what's going on within their state. Unfortunately, we found in some cases, the instructors actually were unaware of what the Practice Act language or what limitations they might have within their jurisdiction. Now, of course, there, what we see is also that this is not just a matter of jurisdiction. A graduate of any PT program should be capable of practicing in any state, including those states that already have imaging referral privileges. And that is around a fifth of all jurisdictions at the present time. One of the things that we also are encouraged about is that in completing this, that our data will, will serve as an impetus to provide for a great update in the imaging education manual, um, that the, the data that we have in there, again, will move the imaging education manual revision forward and that specific recommendations can be made on that. Uh, we also need to look at better defining the competencies for DPT, as well as residency and fellowship. We may think that residents and fellows have knowledge in these areas, and that may or may not be the case. As for the DPT, I will make reference to the, the, the paper that was mentioned earlier, Lance Mabry's paper, paper that was published in the summer of 22, specifically goes into the individual tasks that PTs need in order to refer for imaging. And I think that's a great starting point for defining these competencies. And if you're looking to advance your educational program, looking at those individual tasks and skills is also a great way to look at what specific competencies to target. Next slide. 
Okay. So, thanks. Oh, so just a, a couple uh, last slides here to uh, to wrap this up. Um, at the bottom of the slide, so it's not a matter of if this should be included in uh, in our our curricula, um, but how best to and how best to assess our students and and what are the competencies that are expected. And in many ways, the competencies for our DPT grads have been set. From a practice perspective, we look at the APT, APTA position that was published, uh, House adopted in 2012, the new edition of the Model Practice Act that just came out from the Federation. And, um, and again, the examples of practice acts and rules and regulations that include qualifications for PTs to have this ability, it includes a DPT graduate. And in terms of education, the bar also has been set by CAPTI Standard 7. And also in the uh, FSBPT, the, um, the national board exam, diagnostic imaging is included in the content outline. So it's listed there along with other things that our students are going to be, going to be tested on. We want to acknowledge um, we have three uh, great uh, collaborators. Uh, Chuck and I in this project are students of Chuck's at University of Kentucky, uh, Rebecca, Bryson, and Trent. They have presented this data at a Kentucky chapter meeting and just recently at the uh, AOM conference in St. Louis. They did a great job. Um, so they were a, a big help as we worked our way through this project. So kudos to the three of them. And again, we also want to come back and just thank for any of you in the audience that completed the survey. You know, as Chuck mentioned, we're inundated with surveys, but thank you for taking the time to do so. And then also our survey reviewers uh, that helped us tweak the survey itself before we implemented the survey. Um, so Amy, George, Mike, Meg, and Brian, thank you all very much. And then again, the imaging SIG for this, this opportunity. There are a lot of great resources out there. Uh, for more information about the project itself or just the experiences, this is the email uh, for, for Chuck and I. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you're having trouble finding resources, we can certainly help you find resources, whether the, through the Imaging SIG or through APTA or in finding an individual for you. We will, we will work with you until you get the, uh, uh, the help and assistance that you need. And also in this file, there are some references provided for you. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back over to Bruno and whether it's the chat box or any questions or comments that people have, may have. Thanks so much, Bill and Chuck. That was great, really appreciated. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I just wanna quickly actually go to the resource page. Um, so does everybody see this? No, because I'm not yeah. sharing. That's why. Yeah. Okay. Oh, how about this? There we go. There no, we well. go. Okay. So that's so we posted uh, um, the uh, the resources under news items of interest. You can click the um, click onto the link. It's uh, links above right there on our AOPT imaging site, and uh, really easy to get there. Um, and uh, encourage you to please take advantage of it. I'm gonna leave it up just for a few seconds and um, let's open the questions up for the uh, for our participants here. Anybody uh, anybody have any questions for Bill or Chuck on this? There's kind of Bruno, a nice Bruno, Brian. I'd like to mention, is, is Brian Young here? Brian, are well, you participating? I recognize that our vice, pres our vice president. I'm here. Imaging Brian? here, yeah. Yes, I'm here, Chuck. Do you, Chuck, you want to just... Yeah, so Brian is the Imaging SIG Vice President and Education Chair, and he's heading up the revision of the education manual. And I thought, Brian, you might just give an update of where that stands at present and what what will evolve in 2024. Sure. Hey, Bruno, do you mind uh, stop sharing there when you're done? We're we're um, working hard through this um, manual. We had a, a good push for the first half of um 2023, then I had to divert for a couple of reasons. One, some health issues that came up for me. Um, and then secondly, um, I'm in the, the deep um, abyss of CAPTI right now for uh, a, 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 a upcoming um, review next year. But we're going to get through this and uh, and get our team back together. And we also are waiting on this um, presentation from Bill and Chuck 
with some data and another study that I'm, I'm working on with clinical instructors, I think they can really inform how we can approach uh, the next stages. So we have a robust team and we may be reaching out to anyone in the SIG for, for, for inputs as well, or some review with this as we move forward with it. But um, that's where we're sitting right now and, uh, and look forward to incorporating this data, this fine data into our next um, our next manual and getting it out there to a wider audience. We realize um, many folks have, have not seen that because it was in the uh, SIG pages. So we're going to try to get it out to um, a much broader audience as well. Awesome. I have uh, anybody have any questions? Bruno, there's a there's a comment in the in the chat box. Is that um, a Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, respond. there's a large variation in a number of hours of, of imaging in the 2014 paper, and there was, I think it was the range is like from two to 75 hours. Um, well, the range in, in our data, then the more recent data, was one hour to 296 hours. So the range was, was even more so. So what does that tell us? Well, probably nothing is, is what that means. Um, I think it's probably a little more telling the breakdown of where people spent their hours in terms of cl um, clinical guidelines for referral, you know, the physical properties of imaging is probably a little more, more helpful. And, um, and I think part of the, one of the issues that maybe explains some of the variabilities, there are a number of programs, more than one faculty member completed the survey. There were different faculty that had responsibility in this area. So their perceptions may not have been, you know, exactly in line. So um, I mean, Chuck, you can weigh in as well. My personal thought back in fourteen, I was really kind of hung up on the number of hours. I think the mean back then was twenty five hours, and you know, the mean for our current study was closer to thirty. But I'm not sure that really matters. What comes down to is student competence. And, um, and how they're being tested, what they're being tested on, and then, uh, and then that, that being carried over into the, the clinical internships as the students wrap up their experiences. I think there was a fair amount of individual interpretation of what that question might have meant, yeah. too. Uh, when you go up to 296 hours, evidently some people were, were basically including huge, all courses. To, to some degree to, to get to that many hours. So it all of that data was very difficult to interpret, to uh, assign a, a specific meaning to it. As, as Bill mentioned, the numbers were really all over the place. It, if, we, if we looked at mean and median, those hung right there in the upper 20s to around 30 hours uh, overall. Do you want to respond, uh, Bill? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm staying in the chat box here. Um, Sandra Kaplan asked, did the survey drill down into the content um, and how competence is defined and whether referral processes were, were teased out? You know, we did drill down to the point of, uh, again, how much time was spent related to teaching the clinical guidelines for when referral is appropriate? Um, the impact of imaging findings on the development of our plan of cares. So it was kind of at that level. Um, we didn't really drill down beyond that. Chuck, I can't remember if there were any comments that the responders provided in terms of more details about content. No, I mean, I, I think our survey was rather robust. I mean, it took a while to get through the entire thing. So, of course, when you're designing a survey, you have to come to a point where our have we asked enough? We probably shouldn't go in any more detail than what we are actually going, just because if a survey gets too long, people are simply are not going to complete it. So I, I think we did the best that we could with that type of framework. Yeah. Okay. Um, Angela Campbell asked a question, um, and maybe Brian, you may know this. Uh, the military has several studies related to PT practice and imaging. Has the military done an economic value study on cost savings by PTs prescribing imaging? 
That's a that's a great question, and and not to my knowledge. I know we've looked at uh, competence. Um, uh, Mike Crowell was just on here, and maybe he moved on his square, but I know he's done some work of how of accuracy with uh, ACR guidelines and imaging order. And there's Mike. Um, you might have some other additions to add to, but I don't think we've gone to the level of any cost savings um, <laughs> in there. Mike, do you have any inputs? Uh, not directly cost savings. And I think maybe the closest we ever got was looking at low back pain imaging with the HEDIS measure and just the, the number of PTs that uh, were in compliance with that measure versus primary care docs in a cohort. They were all young, healthy people, but it was about not in the 90% range for the PTs and then in the low 80% range for the primary care docs. So it was, it was better, but both people were still technically, I think 80% is the target. So we were both doing fine, but I think the PTs were a little bit more judicious in that sense. Well, there are several studies that actually look at utilization and show lower utilization by PTs, but they haven't really tied it specifically to cost, correct? Not, yeah, not to cost yet, unless Matt Garber has his hand up. Matt was another military PT. Interested to hear what Matt's addition is here. What do you say, Matt? Yeah, it was... It I did from from embedding PT directly in primary care in one of the clinics that I ran. We looked at the HEDIS met metric for low back pain because it was so much improved by embedding PT. So we we imaged a lot less once we put the PTs in primary care, and they educated the primary care providers on the HEDIS metric. So we we had a lot less unnecessary imaging for low back pain as a result. So. It was a part of an economic analysis, but it wasn't specific. We, we were looking at kind of the big picture of the impact of putting PTs in primary care directly and, and looking at cost savings. But again, it wasn't specific to, to the imaging part, but we did show much improved uh, adherence to the HEDIS metric with low back pain. Matt, is this published anywhere? Uh, the larger kind of cost savings article was in... Um, the Orthopedic Academy quarterly about two or three years ago. Hey, if, uh, I could, uh, if I could uh, beg you to, to send me a link to that because we're sure. looking for essentially creating a resource guide uh, aimed to inform um, uh, legislators. So whatever evidence you can bring to me that I can uh, pick apart and use uh, for these hot button issues uh, would be really appreciated. And that goes for everybody else mm -hmm. out there. Uh, so please, fuel us with all this info information. The one thing that I think Tim Flynn would weigh in on this, um, this is indirect, but the sooner you involve physical therapists in the de decision-making process and the management of an orthopedic patient, the less your costs are. Uh, and there is information on that. Uh, so when, when, when we're involved, it just results in a patient getting less imaging, uh, less procedures, um, and cost savings. So there's actually cost savings on that. So it's not, it's 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 a little more indirect, uh, but there's some interesting results from that. Anybody else have a, um, any questions here or comments? Yeah. Go ahead. If I could speak to what Mike and Matt described and then and, and the results um, of their work that thankfully, and knock on wood, the report card has been good so far in terms of PTs following guidelines and appropriately ordering imaging when they have the ability to do so. Um, so it's, you know, hopefully that, that trend will, will continue. Um, but, you know, it comes down to, it, it starts in the DPT education process of students being exposed to the guidelines. We don't have guidelines for every single body region. That's where the ACR criteria come, appropriateness criteria come into play. That the students, they need those tools before they get out and start practicing as a licensed PT. And we need, we need more data. <laughs> yes. So are people not using the ACR guidelines because they're just unfamiliar with it? Or uh, what, what do you think? What's the barrier there? Uh, maybe I, I was under a rock when you told this. I, well, I didn't address it specifically, but you know, one of the things that, that's really interesting about this too is that there are numerous studies that actually show that it is not routinely taught in medical schools, uh, which to me is mind-blowing. 
that you have this consensus derived guideline that goes at the heart of uh, overutilization and unnecessary expense and it's not part of medical education routinely and again there are multiple studies that that demonstrate that so again this goes back to bill's original point that if we ramp this up we can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem of the inappropriate utilization of imaging I, uh, I, <laughs> it's funny, I work with hematologists, oncologists. So whenever I mention, you know, the ACR rules, blah, 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 <laughs> they're going, <laughs> deer caught in headlights. So, and they have got a great sense of humor about this because they ask us for our, we're embedded in that type of a, a scenario. And they ask us for imaging suggestions. So it's kind of fun. I think uh, the ACR guidelines, uh, it's an elegant way of going about things, not terribly difficult, but you're right. Uh, and I, I want to say this before we go to Linda, who's got a question and a hand raised. Um, you know, we're the only we're the only allied profession and non non orthopedic profession uh, that actually pays so much atten attention to radiology. Uh, nurse practitioners and PAs certainly don't pay attention to it. Uh, primary care, not so much, like you mentioned, and um, and they've got imaging privileges, so we're always upping our game. Uh, but I think uh, we're already way ahead of the curve. That's just a comment. Linda, you got something for us? I do. I think uh, all these comments are great, and it's kind of a piggyback on the imaging with um, medical versus PT. Uh, in academia, I take advantage of um, working with other professions. So we had an intra-professional day when we had uh, medical students in the same room with the PT students asking about imaging and did a low back case. And I had a physician up front speaking with me of who would do imaging, you know, for basic low back pain. And it was amazing because all the med students wanted to do it right away. And then they broke out into small groups. And then the PTs said, mm -hmm. we wouldn't. And they said, why wouldn't you? And they didn't know half of the tests that we know how to do. Um, and the advantage of the therapeutic exercise um, progression that we know. And so I think that's just something that we need to cater to in academia as well. Or the other it, disciplines. It, one more comment on the ACR appropriateness criteria. If you look at Lance's paper, Lance Mabry's paper, they published in 2022, where he looked at the individual tasks of referring for imaging, the two that scored the lowest are instantly remedied by using guidelines like the ACR appropriateness criteria. So there's no reason not to use it. All right, indeed. Aaron, Kyle, you're silent. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> Thanks, you. I, boy, every time I go to one of these, I get so excited, guys. I don't know about you, but I, I really feel like there's some momentum finally in making some changes. And Bruno, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Chuck, you've been after this for so long. Thank you so much for the, the hard work. And, and Bill, I want to be like you when I grow up. That, that's my motto in life. So no, really, I'm just so grateful for all the hard work done. And, and whenever I get next to people that are like-minded, I really feel like there's hope that, that we really can do this. And just going from three states back, you know, that had imaging privileges originally when you did it now to what is it, 11 or 12? Yeah. That says something. So we're, we're seeing it, you know, in real life, we're seeing changes and it's because of the great work of, of people like, like Bill and Chuck and others. So that's all I got to say. Keep it up guys. Just keep it up. And Bill, if this is retirement for you, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I don't understand that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Aaron, put yourself on that list too. Yeah. Yeah. Bruno, if I could, if I could add a comment, the retirement could be another, another session, another presentation sometime. Um, Donna mentions in the, in the chat box that it's interesting that how many folks use a textbook and in, in the textbook used more often than not is the McKinnis textbook. And they're and they're discussed. The ACR criteria are discussed in the textbook. So seems her comment was everyone seems to be using it, but are they actually reading it? Um, you know, and it just kind of comes back to the general principle that once a resource is out there, it 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 needs to be 
put out there over and over and over again. You know, one time presentation or one time notice that this resource exists is just not going to fly. Um, people miss it. People miss that email. Somebody new comes in to teach the content area. Um, you know, Chuck mentioned. I think. I think the the academy and the imaging sig and APTA you know, with with all of us helping. We need to do a better job of getting the word out there. And don't assume if you get out there once that that takes care of it. Uh, persistence is the key. I'm sure if we actually promoted ACR guidelines uh, to our membership and the, the APTA, I think the ACR would actually be tickled that we were doing that and compliment it. Um, I actually went through the, the files and folders of the ACR and compiled all the diagnostics that we would need that, that might be germane to physical therapy practice. And I got it down to a bunch of folders. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you're just giving me the idea that we really need to add that to our resource page and uh, mm -hmm. and just and and do email blasts and say, hey, this is this is totally available. Use this. It's it's really not hard. It's very elegant. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's that's right. I think we just have to promote it like anything else. Um, and uh, and people will realize how implementable it is, for lack of a better word. And for any instructors who are out there, I have some specific exercises on how to use the ACR appropriateness criteria, how to incorporate that into your classes. Um, so if anybody's interested in something like that, I, I would certainly be glad to share that with you. It sounds like another uh, ISIG meeting topic, <laughs> maybe a teaching session. I think that'd be great. Please don't Taking encourage him. <laughs> Terry's shaking his head vigorously. Um, so anybody else got any uh, remarks? Any uh, any uh, any counterpoint? Um, any comments? Anything's welcome here. This is open forum. Please. Yep. Bill's iPhone wants to talk. I think he just butt called us. Okay. Well, that's all right. So, um, Bruno, do you want to touch on that about the those resources again? You've got that. We've got that whole set of things on the Imaging Safe website. Sure. Why don't I do that one more time to remind people? Uh, first, I got um, I got corrected. Um, let's see here. There we go. So I said Saturday, February seventeenth, fifteenth, uh, um, and it was uh, Dr. Gibfried that actually uh, corrected me. It's February seventeenth. Sorry, guys. Um, let me get to that. Uh, I'm just going to scroll quickly through all this stuff and get you to. And by the way, if anybody needs these slides or anything they want, please let me know and uh, I'd be glad to get it to you. So anyways, get onto our website, our web page. You might have to actually be an AOPT iSIG member. Shameless plug. It's easy. It's free. Um, so go to new items of interest. It's right below uh, all this stuff here. It's front page and center, and just click onto the link. Um, this and this is germane to what uh, we just uh, we just witnessed here. So please take advantage of it. Uh, Julie Wagner has a question. Um, mine isn't really a question as much as it's a, uh, a comment. I'm a student at GW in the DPT program right now, and uh, Dr. Matt Garber is actually my professor, and this has been a really cool presentation to see how my program is doing a pretty great job at just outlining everything that was outlined in the presentation. And I'm, I'm excited. I have a mentor who is an advocate for diagnostic ultrasound. So I sort of went into this pretty excited about all that. Um, and I'll be at CSM. So I'll try to find you guys when I, um, when I get there and, and yeah, I'm hoping to find ways to, to just incorporate this into my practice as soon as I can. I love it. I love it. Do we have anybody else with a comment? Yeah. Bruno, if I could just, the uh, the chat Indeed. box. Yeah. Um, Sandra Kaplan mentions that if we consider putting together a, a toolbox together to crowdsource these resources, and that ties into Carrie Schwer from up in Madison, might the ISIG create a guideline for CIs to implement this as well? So basically a toolbox for CIs. Um, I would love to have the help if you're interested. <laughs> it's hard to function as an army of a few. So if you got ideas, we are open and we'd love to uh, recruit you for all these tasks. I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah, the more we can spread this uh, this uh, resource, the better. 
uh, Terry Chuck might be able to recruit a student group to put said <laughs> materials together. What do you think, Bill? <laughs> I'm sure we would have we'd have a lot of help. Um, so, yes, I think, you know, um, we make it a priority. We'll find we'll find ways to get it done. No, but the idea of doing a CI tool set up, that would be something that would be very uh, appropriate for a student project, Chuck. We got room on our uh, website, so please have at it and just talk to me. Um, you can reach, uh, we'll get a link out. Actually, if anybody wants to know, okay, I guess I can, it's easy to get in contact with me. Um, I'm at bruno.steiner at wacbd.org. I can um, probably how do I get this message to everybody in the chat. Just in it's, case you get in contact with me and get these uh, resources or information, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Bruno, let me mention no, too please. that uh, our manuscript for this is in review. Oh, yeah. Uh, What's going on? So, so we hope to have some word of that relatively soon. And Fingers crossed, if it is published soon, we would like to get word out to all the individual education programs of that being published. So, again, there's our wider dissemination already. I'm excited. Uh, please keep us uh, informed. Uh, Julie Wagner has a hand up. Julie? That was, that was a previous hand up. My apologies. Okay, I thought you just you're so enthusiastic. You wanted to share more, and we're willing to hear. It. I'm I'm enthusiastic, but not so much as to make another comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's fair. Um, okay, so Matt's got a split. Who else? Uh, Doctor Steiner, how do we contact you with the slide deck? Okay, that's great. Um, Megan, did you answer? Did you uh, uh, answer Megan's question? Bill, sorry, I was distracted. Um, let's see. Send this message to her. It oh. wasn't a question. Okay. I would yeah, just... yeah, gotcha. It was a suggestion. It's all good. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks, Megan. So, Bruno, for the for the slide deck, the PowerPoint slides, mm -hmm. um, I think we we're going to work on trying to post that on the iSig site with Tara. But, um, you know, if people contact, you know, either Chuck or I or Bruno, you know, directly, we'll, we'll send you the, the file uh, so you have access to that. Yeah. And please, if we're running out of questions, like I said, I am a resource. I'm pretty good about answering my calls. I'm very passionate about this stuff. If you need information, um, please inform, just ask me. Um, oh. it's, really, it's really important that you actually contact us and make sure you don't make any inquires, inquiries to state boards with, uh, with language that is going to torpedo us. Uh, so please, um, you know, really take advantage of our resources. I am here for you. I'm a rapid response type of person, and this stuff means a lot to me. So uh, go ahead. Charles, you wanted to say something. No, I said Tara said that slides have already been posted. There you go. All right. Are we done here, folks? Oh, Terry. Terry's done. <laughs> Look, I want to wish you all a happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, and a happy 2024. And uh, may good things happen in 2024 as they have in 2023. I really appreciate you uh, spending so much time with us uh, on, uh, on, on this really important stuff. This is absolutely crucial to our profession. Thank you so much, Chuck Hazel, Bill Boysenall. Fabulous. Appreciate Brian Young, our VP of Education of the ISIG, and also George Benick, who uh, managed to, to make it to the meeting. Uh, sorry about the link, George. He's our research chair, and uh, we're wishing you the best for the season, Shirish. Thanks for joining us and everybody else. Please do not hesitate to call me. Oh, Annette Karim, our, our board director, is also here. Well, we've got an all-star cast here, so thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it, and We'll see you um, in January if you can make our next uh, ISIG meeting and discuss with Dr. Scott Brown his experiences and some really cool, cool um, evidence that supports, once again, PT imaging referral in North Dakota. I will see you in the new year, folks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bruno. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks for Thanks, everyone. everyone. Bruno.